what we're going to be doing tonight is is something that's very 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 uh, dear to me. And, um, we have Dr. Shane Peak uh, from the University of British Columbia, and um, he is working with us this week and various other experts on the world after project. And what this is, it's two and a half years old now. And we decided what we were going to try to do was gather together information on sky cultures for the entire world. Every single culture out there. Nobody had done it before. Everyone said, when, I, when we put this on, you're crazy. You have no idea what the scale of these things you're taking on. Are you, are you nuts? And I went, yes. <laughs> I'm doing this. Bring it on. So now we have over 14,000 asterisms from 570 plus cultures. And we're helping people recover these guys all over the world. And this is a reconciliation project. We're using the two eyes seeing approach, which is something that we got from our three elders in the Mi'kmaq people. We're helping the Halifax Center, we're helping them recover stuff <laughs> four years ago. And that means basically we share perspectives. My perspective as an astronomer is that these are the stars in the sky and these are the ways that they've been depicted over the years. And the knowledge keepers that work with us, they are the ones that uh, share the stories that go with it. So my job is to find the stars and help people put the, the stories back in the sky. But once I've shown you where it is, it's the knowledge keepers that from the various cultures that tell you the story because it's their story to tell. And they, and the two perspectives overlap and, and the results are all of our perspectives at the end. It's, it's been a great program so far. We've got people all over the world working on this. And so, um, here we have assistant professor of teaching, University of British Columbia at Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences, Dr. Shane Dispeak. It's always weird to hear like your name and like something behind it. That seems really odd because I don't feel like an assistant professor. I just feel like this kid who lived grew up in Arley, Montana. I don't feel like that. But you know, um, I always wondered about the stars since I was just a little kid. You know, I always look at them. And but our some of our older people had forgotten the. Um, some of the things about them. And I ask them, and they wouldn't know. They say, well, I don't remember, or my grandfather didn't tell me that, or we, we, we forgot about those things. <clears throat> so I took it upon myself, a, a journey in life, not, not really as a, as a profession or as a, like a research project. I just did it because I wanted to know for my own kids, for, for my own people to understand and know what these things are. Um, but I'm wondering if we can um, maybe dim the lights not right now, but here in a second. Okay. That, can we do that? Okay. Okay. In a little bit. And what, if you stand right that? in front of this, you're in front of the camera. So it really okay. see it. There you go. Okay. I might wander a bit, but I'll try to stay put. I, I, I have a hard time uh, standing in one spot. So anyway, I, I, I sent along this title because um, Charles was bugging me about a title. And I was like, I don't title. And then when I got here, I forgot to make a title slide. So. I had to find his email, what I told him I was going to talk about, and I threw it up there. So anyway, yeah, this this describes some some three three um, uh, groupings of stars that I've been sort of investigating uh, that are related to some uh, creation stories that we have in our own homes, and I never really understood that they were connected to these grouping of stars until later in life, and in fact, moving here to um, Vancouver, this area. Understanding that our um, our nations um, are very similar, our stories are very similar, our languages are very similar. So I started to be able, I started to understand that the stories of our relatives here, I could add little pieces to the story that made it more full and more understandable. And for whatever reason, different tribes and different groups, we had the the privilege of retaining different parts, but sometimes not the whole story. So it was really nice. It was like I was meant to come here to learn more about these things. So I'm going to walk you on a little journey, my learning journey. And this is un this is not settled matters. I, I think this is the way it goes. 
We'll find out. It seems to make sense. But yeah, this first of all, this is where this is where I come from. Arley, Montana. Me and my wife and my my son. We moved from there two and a half years ago. We're the easternmost Salish speaking band. So we speak all the all the groups across this little region speak some variant of Salish. <clears throat> and um the 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 red pin, is that about, about where we're at? Because I did this really quickly. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the right place, right place. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's pretty um it's pretty interesting that um not only do some of the languages align, but some of the stories align as well. So it makes a lot of sense. So we're gonna get into the story. Are you guys ready? Don't sound like it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I want to hear it. Yeah. What about you guys on Zoom? Are you ready? I see one guy. Yeah. Said, Lazy boy. All right, he's ready. I'm great. I'm good. I'm ready to go. Okay, we're gonna do this. Okay, let's find out what happens. So I got to We're gonna start at the beginning because this is this is sort of how I I'm trying to figure things out because there's a timeline. And I don't have it quite squared away, but we're going to see if we can figure it out. Can, can we dim these two? Is that possible? Let's do that. Let's get in the mood here. The right mood. Oh, there it is. Yeah, how about that? Okay. So everybody's accustomed to um, seeing this, right? Yeah, we see that. But if we go back... Thousands and, and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, things used to be a bit different when we look into the night sky. So if we step back, I don't know how many, time is such a weird thing, but at some point in time, this is sort of what the night sky looked like. And then if we walk back even further into time, now this is time according to our tradition that we might even see something that looked more like this. Look familiar? And if we step, step back even to the beginning, the beginning of time, of all things, among, at least in our tradition, the night sky would have looked like this. So right at the beginning of time, there was a there was a man, his name was Amotkin. His name kind of means this one who sits on top, sits on top of this mountain. And he's pondering his um his own existence, I would think. I don't know, I wasn't alive then, but I could figure he's thinking about what he ought to do. And like any man, you know, we get when we get idle, we get a bit crazy and we have some crazy thoughts about life and things. So he decided, I'm gonna create. Uh, I'm gonna create some beings. So he created some beings. And prior to doing this, sort of the world began. And on top of his mountain was various things growing. And so when you looked up, you could see the those things growing through his mountain. So you could see a few things up in the sky at this time. So he created a, a group of, of beings, and these people were not, they were not that good. They were kind of wild and crazy, and they, they, weren't, the, they weren't the right thing. He felt these, these aren't the right thing that I wanted to create. So he created a huge flood across the land and destroyed all these beings that he created. And he went back to thinking about his life again and what he was up to, and Motkin thought, well, I'm going to try again. I don't want to fail at this. I'm going to try again. So he created a race of giants, these huge beings that roamed across this place that we're at now. But again, these, these giants, these giant people, they went kind of crazy too, and they, they stopped listening. They stopped listening to the, the things that they needed to do. So subsequently destroyed this race of giants in a fire, burnt them all. So again, he goes back to thinking, Motkin's thinking about what, what to do next. He's like, failed twice, I'm gonna try again. This time he created a race of tiny people, real tiny people. Things are going good, but just like the last time, 
They kind of rebelled against him, didn't listen, demanded things, or but we don't really know what. So he destroyed this race again with disease, spread the disease around him, killed them all, wiped them out. So he was contemplating his next move, thinking about what he needed to do next. And he had an idea, another sort of race of being that he wanted to create that was going to be sort of a perfection or something that was going to be learning from all the mistakes he made. And he had to dreamt of these things that he was going to put on the earth next. This is interesting. But then not on camera. His mother stepped in. His mother's name was Skoy. Oh, yes. He said, um, he said, um, you know, you, you made a bunch of mistakes. He said you need a self you need to send a helper down to the earth in, in your land to prepare the land for for this next being that you're gonna create. You're gonna need to know how to survive. You've seen all the mistakes you made. Send a helper. Yeah. They'll know what to do. No, we didn't know. So he sent Sinchala, the coyote. He said, "Okay, Sinchala, you're gonna you're gonna have quite a job to do." He said, "And um, I need you to you need to really help me out here." So Sinchala, you know, he's kind of a kind of a braggy guy, and he's, oh, yeah, that's gonna be easy." He said, "That's it's easy. That's all you want me to do?" He said, "Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of monsters and." Things that need to be um, destroyed off the earth before I make this next um, these next creatures. He says, "Yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you covered, Amotkin. No, no worries." But he's kind of a fool, you know. He he thinks he knows, but he just kind of he doesn't he doesn't think too much. He's kind of like a like a young guy, you know, a young guy. We're sort of foolish. We're young. We're full of confidence, and we end up making a lot of mistakes. Anyway, in one of the stories of Coyote's pursuits to kind of prepare the land, he was um, he was involved in this uh, sort of the story that we call the Esquilath, this, this story about his, um, it's about his kids, Esquilath. So in this story, he was... Um, at some point in his pursuits on the earth, he met up with um, with the badger and his and his wife. And he thought, "Boy, I want to live with I want to live with you guys." He said. And uh, so badger, his wife said, "Well, I got all these kids, man, and you know, I I don't know if we got, I don't know if we can take you in." But the husband said, "Oh yeah, I'm a good hunter. He can stay with us, no problem." So Sinchala said, all right, good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you around. He said, I'm going to show you how to hunt better. That's kind of was how the way he was. <clears throat> he said, but I got my kids too, so I'm going to bring my kids along. So Badger's wife was like, oh, my God, all these kids. He said, well, yeah, I got some more kids too. They're, they're, all, they're still coming. More kids came and more kids came. And finally, his wife showed up. And she's like, oh, God, Sinchala, what are you doing? What are you doing now? She was, her name was... She was the mole. She says, oh, she was just sick of his antics all the time. He was always dragging him around. She says, oh yeah, we're gonna stay with Badger. They're gonna, I'm gonna show him how to hunt. He's a really poor hunter, but really it was the opposite. Badger was a really good hunter. So <clears throat> they start their time living with them, um, living with the badger, and so right off. Badger says, okay, come on, we're going to go hunt. we got to feed all these kids. And of course, since you led, Coyote's like, eh, yeah, okay, let's go. I'll show you what to do. Of course, he doesn't know what to do. Badger's got all the, he's got some good hunting powers. And so he can track down deer and everything. And he can always bring back meat. And so every day he's dragging Sinchala out to go hunt and Sinchales, he's kind of a lazy bum and he don't want to go, but he feels like he has to. So, all right, let's go hunt again. So day after day, just to feed all the kids and everybody, they, they continue to go hunting day and day and day after day. Finally, Sinchales was like, God, all this hunting and 
getting just hungry. I feel like I'm not even eating. So he kind of got it in his mind. He thought, okay, this badger looks really fat. Oh my God, look at him. Look at all that tasty meat. So he took out his knife and sure enough, he kills badger. Eats him up. Oh, he's just full. He's like, oh yeah, this is hunting. He's thinking, yeah, this is what, this is how we ought to be. I don't know why Badger was making us walk all over the place. The meat was sitting right there. So he takes a little nap and he's thinking about his life. Oh yeah, I said that was just right. Just the right amount of food for me. For me. I don't know what those other people are gonna eat. Meanwhile, Badger, just like um a lot of things, there's a lot of animals were roaming around, and so word got back to Badger. Badger's wife, that coyote, Sinchale, killed his hus her husband. So she was just upset. She's got all these kids. And she's like, well, I'm out of here. I don't, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. So she packed up all her things. She told all her kids to gather all their stuff. And she, she looked at one of, one of Coyote's favorite kids and said, why don't you grab that um, bucket, Coyote's? I'm going to take it. So his... Favorite kid, Coyote's favorite kid, grabbed the bucket and they said, all right, we're out of here. They all packed their stuff up and they took off along with Coyote's kid and his favorite bucket. So his wife is sitting there like, oh, God, what did she, what did he do this time? What did Sinchile do this time? So meanwhile, Sinchile, he's uh, finally makes his way back. And he's like, hey man, where um, where's uh, where's my bucket? And his wife is like, uh, well, Badger took it. And he's why why did Badger take it? He said, well, you kill it, you kill her husband. And he's like, what? I did not. I didn't kill nobody. Where's my bucket? And he got really mad, and he was gonna go punish her. And she took off. He's like, I'm out of here. You can take care of all these kids. I'm leaving. Sinchile was really mad. He said, I want my bucket back. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stand for this. I'm gonna go find him. I'm gonna go look for them. I'm gonna get my bucket back. This is this is too much. So he takes off, going to look for this bucket. Finally tracks him down. He tracks down Badger and all her kids. And his his favorite kid is running, running along with him. And, Sinchile is chasing after him. He's yelling at him, I'm going to kill you all. He said, you know that's my favorite bucket. You better come back here. He's running after him, trying to catch up back up to him. Finally, he gets to a point where he's almost caught up to him, but they're still taken off from him. He can't quite catch him. He's still yelling at him, trying to get their attention, trying to track him down. But they're all taken off. Next thing you know, Badger, she grabs two head lices from her head. She throws them behind her and keeps going. And these two head lices, they, they're they little girls. And they land right in front of Sinchile. And he stops and he starts looking at these, these two head lices that was thrown in front of him. They look kind of goofy. And then he stops and takes a look at him and says, oh, what are you guys doing? And they say, oh, nothing. We're just playing around. And so they grab hands and they start singing around and they start spinning. And Sinchile is kind of getting amused by this. Like, oh, yeah, look at these little girls dancing around. And he says, hey, why don't you like, um, why don't you guys fight? Why don't you guys fight? Okay, let's fight. And they start slapping each other. And Sinchile just starts laughing because he's, these little girls are slapping each other in the face. He laughs so hard, his eyes start getting red, and he's got that big laugh going on that he can't stop. Laughing and laughing, just laughing away at these two little girls slapping each other in the face. And just at that moment, there was a big change, a transformation that happened. And at that moment, Sinchile was turned into a star in the sky. The two girls
turn into a star in the sky. Badger, turn into a star. Coyote's favorite kid with the bucket, turn into a star. Badger's, couple of Badger's kids turn into a star. All rose up into the sky, turn into a star. And importantly, Sinchala's abandoned kids all went up into the sky. You guys recognize that? You know where? Was it really? Was it? You sure? Well, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, was. Yeah. So now the night sky looked like this. The addition of a little group of stars. You see Coyote's kids up there? You guys see it? Yeah. Squidal, that's the abandoned kids. And then you can see Sinchala down there, his, his eyes are all red. That star right there, if you look, it's all red. Kind of got a reddish glow. And off to the right, is a, if you look at it on a real clear night, you can see the pair of head lice girls making him laugh. And then right in front of him, you can see kind of a chain of stars. Badger. I don't know which one is Badger and which one's the kid, but they're in that group there somewhere. So that's one story. <laughs> okay. So now night sky looks like this. A few more stars in the sky. Well, this next story is a bit short, but it, um, it explains a, a certain pattern of stars in the sky. So this was, a, again, long, long ago. Probably when, when, uh, when the people that Amotkin was going to create, when they were created, and when the animals and the people sort of lived side by side. And um, so they kind of, they were learning from the animals and the animals were showing them different things. In this, in this story, there was a, it's, it's sometimes it's called Eskudlums or Kie, that's the name of what we see up in the sky. Eskutlums is like when you when you say there's the people working on something. And the kie is the name we use for the bark canoe. The kie. <clears throat> so in this story, there was these five friends. They were like um we call them uh SG men, I think. They were like they made they made a pact as the younger kids. And so they did all these things together. They would go to battle together. They would hunt together. Everything they did, they did together. They formed like a tight bond, almost like brothers. They would, they would do all these things together. And so these five friends would do all their things. They're hunting, as I said. They're trapping a little, a little group of, of young men that would do all these things together. They, each of them had a canoe. Like, yeah. They'd get in the water and they'd go fishing together, they go exploring, finding different places to locate food items. They were always together doing things, doing their adventures. And uh, in, in the camps in the old days, you'd see these little group of kids running around together that would make these little bonds. In, their, in some of their pursuits and hunting, one time there was a, a Kwaski. He was he was kind of flying about and seeing and was noting these these young men doing all these things together. It kind of made him happy to see these these kids doing these things together, turning into young men. But he also noticed that their their canoes were getting a bit tattered up, getting beat up a bit, getting old. And he heard these young men talking about it. He said, yeah, our canoes are getting old. We should, we should do something about that. So Kwaskwe, the, the, the blue jay, was listening in. and They all got together one day and said, well, we got we to gotta figure out what to do about these canoes because those ones are getting too old. So they all sat and wondered about what to do. And they came up with an idea. 
I said, I know, I know what we can do. Let's build ourselves one big canoe and we can all be together in a one canoe. We can all go about, do our, our business together. They all thought, yeah, that's a real great idea. Kwaskwe was listening in. He said, oh yeah, there's some just good to see these young men doing this, having these good ideas. So they went about their work. But in the meantime, the wind is kind of a, sort of an enemy of the people. It's always trying to destroy things, always trying to knock camps over, trying to make hunting hard, fishing hard. The wind was listening in and was jealous, jealous of these, these, these men for, for having such a good time. He's okay, I'm gonna, he says, I'm gonna destroy these destroy these boys. I'm going to drown them. As soon as I get their big canoe in the water, I'm going to come in and blow. Big storm in, crack their canoe and drown them all. Because I, I don't like them. I don't like people. I'm going to punish them. So the young men started in on their canoe. Started building up their big canoe. And that wind was just waiting. Just getting happy to be destroying things that these men were making. So Kwaskwe decided to try to help out and said, okay, I can't let these, these men drown. This is, this is not going to be good. We can try to do something to help them. So he called on his, uh, he called on Sun Chile. He said, well, Sun Chile might be able to do something. So he says, Sun Chile, you know, these, um, these men are, we're really trying hard to be together. And we're trying to figure out a way to make a new canoe and do all these good things together. But the wind is gonna it's gonna destroy them, and they don't even know they're gonna they're gonna die. So essentially, even though he was kind of goofy and um, kind of made a lot of mistakes, he, he was he knew he knew sometimes the extent of his power, and he says he says I don't have no really no control over the water. He said, the water is too powerful for me. He said, and I, I fought the wind before and I'm pretty sure I beat him, but I don't know. I'm not sure. He said, so I don't know if I can help you. Koski says, oh, come on. You got to be able to do something. Something you ought, ought to be able to do. So since I said, oh yeah, I know what I can do. I can help you out. I'll make sure your friends never die. They'll always be together. They'll always be doing work together. Of course, we said, oh, good, that'd be great. So, since he, he called upon his powers that he has. And he sent them all up into the sky. He said, there, now it's quit bugging me. Now they're all stars. I don't have to worry about them dying. <laughs> so he was upset. No, I didn't want that. And he flew off. So all these men now are up in the sky. They're always doing work together. Always working hard. You can see them all the time. They all got turned into stars. You might recognize this. Anybody recognize it? Yeah. You can raise your hand if you want. <laughs> yeah, you recognize that? Right? Yeah, that's the... Orion, is it Orion? Yeah, sure. Call it the yeah, that's the canoe, and you see the men standing around. So now the night sky sort of look like this, adding little different patterns in there. You can see all that. I seen these last night coming over on the ferry. You can even see the the the, the twins, the knits. If you look real close, you can see the two the two of them sitting there. And we were looking at these on the ferry ride over last night. Pretty clear. Okay, this is the last one. The last one. You guys ready? You guys are really quiet. Well, you should be quiet, right? You don't talk over me. Good, good, good. All right. So here we go. This one's a really long story, and I had to really kind of condense it because I didn't want to sit here talking too long. This is a long story. A lot of these stories have songs in them, you know? You sing songs during certain parts, like when Sinchile is using his powers. And there's a song that he sings. I, did, I didn't want to do it here. I felt a bit shy. 
to the mind here. Okay. Anyway, so this next story is uh, Sukhulepam. Sukhulepam means it's like the one whose job it is to cook things in the ground. Sukhulepam. Usually that was the women were the ones who who cooked things in the ground. The men were not supposed to be a part of it. There was there was a belief, a strong belief that if the men were any any part of it, anything that was being cooked in the ground wouldn't cook right or it would it would get ruined. So the men, they couldn't be any part of it. They could help maybe tend fire after the pit was dug and everything was put in. But for the most part, the men had to stay stay away. They were told to shoo them away, you know. For some reason, I'm not quite sure why. Kudlapun <clears throat> is this. Is what we call this pattern that end that is in the end. So this one's about uh, a couple of different characters. They appear in a few stories, but for the most part, the chesteya is always mad. He's just mad at everything. He walks around and he's just mad. And he's got a friend um, that's the fisher. So it's the skunk and the fisher or kind of hanging out together and, you know, stay at the skunk. He's always complaining and mad. He's like, God, these pine needles are too sharp. God, it's too cold. You know, Fisher's like, well, you know, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be all right. Don't worry about it. And, and skunk is, ah, what do you know? And, well, let, let's go get something to eat and we'll go hunting. Maybe you'll feel happier. I suppose. You know, he was always grumpy. But Fisher was a really good hunter. He could really hunt well and was always successful. But for whatever reason, whenever he got some game, stay at the skunk, he'd always say, well, why don't you just give me the guts, you know? I'll just want to eat the guts. I don't want none of that meat. Just give me the guts. So Fisher was like, oh, all right, I guess. And so he'd give him the gut pie and stay at, would eat away on it. And Fisher would eat all the good pieces. You know that kind of person who does that? You know, what they call him? Passive aggressive? <laughs> I guess. So Skunk was being passive aggressive. Like, no, I'll just have the garbage meat. You know, I'm you know, trying to feel pitiful. So one day, you know, they kept at this, this, this hunting relationship and stay it, would eat the, eat the leftover, the guts, and all the kind of stuff that you don't know you necessarily want to eat too much of. Well, one day, the... Um, the, the chipmunk and the, and the squirrel's um, mother heard about the, the the fisher. He was a really great hunter. So he sent his daughters off. She sent her daughters off. She said, go, go see if you can marry this fisher. And we'll always have a lot of meat. So we'll always have food to eat. You, you got to go find him, though, and, and make sure that you, you, so you can try to get him to marry you. So we'll always have meat. So they didn't want to, but they said, all right, let's go. Let's go try it out. So they took off, tried to go find Fisher. So they did, and they seen that the um, the skunk was living with them. And the skunk would never help a lot, you know. He would Fisher would go off to hunt, and the skunk would always say, oh, I'll just hang out around camp, you know, I'll clean up, I guess. You go hunt, because I'd probably just get in the way anyway. So whenever Fisher would leave, of course, he'd just hang out and sleep or whatever. So when the, when the squirrel and the chipmunk did arrive, it was just it was just the skunk that was there. And so the, the squirrel and the chipmunk showed up and they said, where's, where's Fisher? And the skunk would say, oh, I don't know. I'm not his dad. I'm not his dad. And he's always grumpy, you know. So, well, when is he going to be back? And he said, I don't know. Why are you asking me all these questions? I don't know where he's at. Then he kind of got a liking to him. He's seen him. He said, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll try to make you to my wife. And they all, they all giggle. No, we're waiting for Fisher. He said, well, he's going to be gone for a while. But come in. He said, come into to my house and I'll feed you. He said, go hide Go hide yourself behind my stuff, behind that log or in there. That's by my things. So then, as he did that, skunk kind of farted a little bit, and they laughed. 
what are you laughing at? Oh, nothing. Skunk fart again and they giggle. What are you laughing at? No, nothing. You're not laughing at nothing. Well, get in the house there. Get into my uh, camp and hide behind there and I'll get you some food to eat. And when uh, Fisher comes back. Okay, so what he did. Sure enough, when Fisher comes back, he had a lot of meat. Of course, Skunk said, yeah, just give me the, just give me the guts. So he takes the guts and gives them to the gives them to the squirrel and the chipmunk and they're looking at this like oh god this is this is what you're going to feed us and so many nights he does the same thing feeds them this this sort of the bad parts of the meat that he doesn't really eat and they kind of live like that way for a little bit then one night finally gets sleepy and he he's like you know what i want you I want you to, you're, since you're kind of my wife's now, I want you to help me. I'm, I'm really uncomfortable when I'm asleep, so I want one of you to be my pillow, and I want one of you to sleep under my tail, so I'll be nice and comfortable. So they said, okay, well, I guess since we're trapped here, I guess we'll do that. So they're waiting and waiting for Ayat to fall asleep, and as he falls asleep, they slowly kind of creep their way out and they slowly start replacing their spots with these sticks. They put some sticks under him so they feel like they're still laying there. And it's fast asleep. He doesn't notice. And while he's sleeping, Fisher comes back and it's like, oh, I heard you were looking for me. And they all say, oh yeah, we want to we want to marry you. And so well come, let's go. We'll take off. We'll leave this this uh, skunk, because he's just grumpy anyway. So they head out, take off. Meanwhile, Ayat's fast asleep. Finally, he wakes up and he's like, what is this? First, he feels the sticks and he thinks, oh my God, I killed, I killed my wives. They're all skinny. I must have slept for years. They're just these little sticks. And then he finally realizes, oh, these are just sticks. And he gets so mad and so that's it. I'm furious. I'm going to go punish people now. So he heads out and he travels all across the land, different places, and he starts killing people. He starts spraying them with this spray, killing anybody he comes across, spraying everybody with this spray. And he's looking all around for his wives. And finally, he comes to this group of women that are cooking camas, the swedli in the, in the ground. As soon as they see him approach, they all turn and they know that he can't approach the, approach the pit. And he knows it too, so he kind of stands back and he's like, God, I would really like to eat some camas. It's sure tasty. And of course, the you know people are always real generous to visitors, even grumpy ones. And so one of the ladies says, well, um, if you're hungry, I can bring you some camas over. And so I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring me some camas over. So she walks away from the pit and leaves them some camas. So hey, it's sitting there eating away. He's like, oh, this is good. And kind of kind of getting his anger out, you know, softening up a bit. And he eats it up. And gets nice and full. Gets ready to leave. He said, okay, I'm I'm going to go find more people to kill. I'm still mad. So as right about he's ready to take off, he has a little accident. A little, little poop, you know. He poops a little bit. <laughs> and he leaves. And the women are, they didn't pay attention to him. And they look back and they say, hey, um, stay at you. You left some camas on the ground there. It's still sitting there. You didn't, you just, you're wasting it. So he comes back and says, what? No, I ate it all. And they said, well, what's that on the ground there? And he gets really, he gets, he looks and he said, oh, that's my poop. That's my poop. And he gets kind of embarrassed. Like, oh my God. And they keep asking, what's that? That's, why'd you leave the camas? And he says, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. What is that? And they keep questioning him and he gets so mad and he starts getting back into his rage again. And just before he starts in his business of killing everybody, 
they all get turned into stars to save them from death. All these women, plus their pile of wood, get changed into stars. You might recognize this one. Maybe not. The pit's right in the middle. Women are standing all around it. I don't know what this one is in the English. Yeah, I think. There's the bell on the right for her. Yeah, you can see the, the star at the top and then the little bell hanging down. Mm. Well, we call it a bell. So yeah. Quoting the kids. So now the night sky sort of looks like this. You can see different patterns in the sky now. So the sky is becoming fuller and fuller. And eventually as the animals, everything sort of turned over and the, the people sort of took over in a way, animals stopped talking. They gave all their gifts that they could give to the people. And then eventually, as, as humanity moved forward, the night sky slowly started to look like, look like this. As more different generations passed on, they started to take their journey across the sky. And every person who takes that journey, they, they're lighting various fires along their way. So this path, we call it Nkok Shufue, like this dusty road. That's where all our ancestors are walking along that road. So every night you can see them. You look up and you can see maybe one of your ancestors made it all the way across. Maybe they're just starting their journey. But that's sort of how we understand, how we're beginning to retake these stories back so we can understand the night sky better. So a lot of people don't haven't heard like the full story of these connected so it took it took a degree of, of looking at our neighboring tribes who have similar traditions to try to connect all these stories together to, to make it understandable and to see how they connect back to the night sky. But that's all I got. That's all. That's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. To see all of the different, the familiar stars, those of us here in the room who are astronomers, we can look up and they recognize patterns, but to hear someone else's perspective on that pattern, overlapping the right. stars belong to everyone. So it just looks like a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotta wait till next time. Just go to Google for World Asperger Project and turn to the page. And all of those posts is all over the world that we got so far. I'm just about to update it tomorrow morning. That's the latest uh, talk. It's all free downloads. There's a handbook that that describes the stars involved. There is a list that gives you the locations and everything and there is a resource list that tells you which authorities are which locations. With the with the uh Higma, for example, when they um, when they discovered parts of the sky with the area to fund it then some of the consideration is all you could you can take a look at it. So that's a nice question. I do have a presentation out there about the 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 dipper. I can't remember if you go to my faculty page at UBC, I have a link. That this it's kind of a confusing one because there's there's been um, uh, an interpretation of it I think that doesn't quite match the story about it. There's a story about a bear, a grizzly bear, but the, but the name we call that we use for the grizzly bear is actually the North Star, that the Little Dipper, and so my, our ancestors called the Big Dipper a different name. So I'm thinking it's it, there's something different there, and I kind of explore that. And I wasn't sure if it was a presentation I did with you, you guys. Did a talk for the General Assembly of the RAC. It was about that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of unresolved matters, but. Some people call stumps. Yeah. Some people call bears. Yeah. Uh, caribou. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That all over the world we have very, very common story is with the big dipper head, where the bucket is actually the animal to help the bear, whatever it is. And the stars of the candle are the hunters. Yeah. And the big bucket, it goes all the way down to the star of Earth. It's the one, seven stars are all birds. You know? <laughs> and the double star in the candle, my star in the foot, is quite often a hunter and his dog. Oh. I got a question online too. I don't know. If... Hey, Dr. Shandon, I just wondered if there might be any stories of uh, an object that we've not, not considered now to be like a telescope object, like the Andromeda Galaxy. I wonder if it's possible because people can see it. You can just detect it naked eye. I seldom can. And I just wondered if there's any folklore or stories about that. Would it, would it have been seen or discussed or noted, the Andromeda Galaxy? Not, yeah, not that I, I've found, but I'm sure there is that, like, like I was mentioning, you know, just reconstructing some of these, you know, where our people kind of went through a pretty a rough time, where a lot of our stories were, were lost. So us young, younger people are really trying to put those back together, I think. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I don't, I don't have a great handle on the, um, the English names of stars, because I, I'm not an astronomer. But I, yeah, or yeah, or you know, com common names I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I'm sure there is, and I I'm always interested, and I'm always looking for um, uh, sources that can help to rediscover those and some of the. There's another question and you, online. And if you don't know the names, look at your other Polynesian cultures, you will find some of them. But if you don't, name them again. So the minimum name for the Hawaiians for the for Orion, the Catholic Raven, the children. So yeah. interesting story. When we first started the club, a woman whose husband was a professor in UBC. He had a teaching star map that he had to draw by hand mm -hmm. the original. I got the original, so I took photocopies of it, and we donated the original to uh, RESC head office for the museum. But he was teaching it at UBC with a hand-drawn map that he had to draw by himself. He was a professor. So <laughs> that was going 1945. No standard church. So, that's when people finally decided to keep a one share information between nations and they go and we use the same map. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Mary Jo. I'm welcome on the Movie Salt Nation. I'm really curious about your songs because I know songs are stories as well. I know you're fine. <laughs> but where is, um, if you're not able or willing to share a song with me tonight or us tonight, where can I find your songs? Because I know there's stories coming in this as well. Mm, yeah. Like the the songs that were sung for like these these oral traditions, mm -hmm. I I think were um were so like personal songs by the storyteller, yeah. so they weren't common. They like when they tell the kids or when they were I telling it. Permission to sing them and 
Oh, yeah, well, I don't, we don't know them anymore. So when I insert a song into the story, it's something that just comes right here yeah. and it, it seems fitting for the time. Yeah. yeah. But songs for other things, yeah. I, it's not, uh, I, I could share any song if you want. What do you want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever comes to mind. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, it, it singing is a pretty powerful thing, you know, and it, it, it really connects us. So that part of, the, of, of that, of these stories, is really missing. It's really missing. So, yeah, I like to um, try to add it in. Um, there's one song that we sing, which is, um, um, it was lost for, for many years. And we, we finally, we're, we're trying to revive it back into our community. And it, re it was really inspired by um, watching the, these Maoris, when they would come to visit, they would have these this way of, introducing themselves to people and i thought you know what they're they seem sort of like us and then i seen other tribes do these other things that seem you know like when you're welcoming someone or introducing yourself to a place and it, it took some you know asking around and, and research to try to figure it out because we we were like a lot of communities in such a low state you know where we had this big movement in the 60s by my parents to try to bring things back. But they didn't, you know, they did only so far Then it was our job. So one of the one of the songs that we we sing when we and we, we can sing it anywhere when we're when we meet a, a people. Like my, when I envision it, I can imagine meeting like a, a tribe on the plains during our buffalo hunts. And we would sing this to indicate that we're we we're not we're not going to fight. It was called the Sinchem Tewit, and it meant the, the song in which we make peace. Like we're we're trying to make sure that we are not going to fight. And it goes like um, and maybe these guys can help me if they if they want to. Hi 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 People would sing it, and when they and when they get done, they go around and shake everybody's hands. Yeah. 